Good to see everybody this morning. Uh, I'm sure you're getting tired of seeing me every Sunday. We'd rather look at these people, but you get me. A few more Sundays. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the Comeback, the youth program that we've initiated a couple weeks ago. So this will be week three. Uh, we will be doing it again here at church. Uh, we've got some different things planned. A um, little change, though, for next week. There's some permission slips we'll need to make sure we get filled out for all of the youth that plan on going to Brother Danny Mathias' house uh, next Sunday after church. We will be fishing and having our lesson out there. Uh, the kids will need to bring a sack lunch with their name on it. Uh, I think we're going to prepare some snacks and drinks and stuff for them. But we do need to get, make sure we get this permission slip signed. And then here is a sample of the shirt Becky has made. So on the front, it says the comeback. And again, we have this in purple and green. In the back, it said, we did, he is. And we've got a couple hashtags there uh, so we can always remember the wonderful coronavirus of 2020. Um, and then, so I'm just going to have my oldest share something maybe that she's had fun doing or something that she likes doing uh, so far with the Comeback Series. Some of my favorite things are spending time with the church. And I've learned a lot, even though we have to stay apart and we're not doing Sunday school or children's church, I'm still learning as much as I always do. Amen. Uh, so she's really look forward to it uh, every Sunday. Uh, Andy Gray, my youngest as well, they're both really enjoying it. Um, we've got a quick video, if we can get that up on the screen right quick. It's less than a minute, but just some snapshots to kind of show you what we've been doing, what we've been up to so far. Um, and while we're talking about the shirts as well, we still need, today's the last day to order one of these. So 15 bucks. Um, can't pay now, you can pay when you pick it up, but we do need to go ahead and get your size put in so Becky can get those made, um, and we'll have those in a couple weeks. Any luck, Becky? Okay. Anybody else want to share anything they've done or enjoyed with you? No? Julie will. She likes to talk. We'll probably have to give her a lemon. <laughs> <laughs> um, me and Ashley have um, the fifth graders and below. Um, we've had a lot, a lot of fun. I get to have my nieces in there. Um, we Last week we talked about um, not being selfish, um, the difference between selfish and what humble is. Um, and we talked about um, the Bible story about Tabitha, how she was a very um, humble person in the Bible um, that actually so clothes for people. Um, that didn't have clothes um, and was very humble about it. And so we kind of went through that whole lesson, um, but we've had lots and lots of fun. Um, the week before, we were at Carol and Mark's house, and um, we did all kinds of water games, um, water balloons, water guns, water everything. Um, but our um, lesson was on um, what influences us. Um, who we're looking at as role models and how we should influence others as Christians. So we've had lots and lots of fun. We've learned a lot. So hope today will be the same. Thanks, Jules. <laughs> All right, if we're not going to be able to get that video, we'll try to show it maybe next time. Oh. So I'll have the permission slips. Um, we'll put a couple by the back door, off of the stack by the back door as well, but just make sure we get that filled out for your child to go next week. Thank you. Good morning, let's all stand and let's get ready to worship this morning. <laughs> Oh. 
he's trying to teach us, Lord. And if I've ever neglected his mentor, Lord, please be the one on your heart, Lord, to bring him closer to you. God, thank you for all the blessings that you've given us, Lord. Please forgive, forgive me where I failed you, God. Amen. 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 Amen
that give us a reason to believe. So we're going to talk about first the last part of verse 17. Look at the very last uh, part of verse 17. I'm going to read it again. And this is this uh, scripture is talking about how Abraham had faith in God. And now we see a, a brief description of the God that they're talking about. It says, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So this is the God we're talking about, the God of Abraham, the one who, in whom he believed, the one we believe in. He's the God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. So that's two attributes of God I want to talk about real quickly. Let's look at the first one. God brings life to the dead. He gives life to the dead. And just so there's no misunderstanding this morning, I want to show you what I'm talking about. Somebody's alive, physically living on this earth, and they die. They're dead. Their life has ended. God has the power because he has the power to restore life. He has the power to touch that person and raise them back again, bring them back to life to restore life to them, to, to give life to the dead. I know that seems pretty easy to understand, but I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying. Because in, in the medical profession now, we've got a lot of medical professionals here today, and I hate to talk about stuff like this because I'm, I know you're staring at me today. He's going to say something wrong. So we have this machine that we bought, right? It's called an AED, Automated Electronic Defibrillator. Did I say it right? Man, I won't ever try it again. AED. What an AED does, we're going to mount it somewhere. You gave the bracket to Brother Tommy back there. I saw you. We're going to mount it on the wall somewhere where it's accessible in case somebody's heart stops while we're here. And you're going to take that little machine and somebody that's trained, not me, I'm not trained, somebody that knows what they're doing is going to take that machine and they're going to try to help the person whose heart has stopped. And, then, and then you turn on the machine, and from what I remember 20 years ago, you turn on the machine and it talks to you. It says, put the electrodes on their body. And I could probably do that. And you stick them on, right? Is this about right? Yeah, it probably is. He's going to go along with me. So you put them on their body somewhere. And it says, it, it tries to detect a heartbeat. And if there's not a heartbeat, then the machine kicks into next, the next gear. It says, you're going to have to shock this body. And at some point, it tells you, push the green button. Or maybe it's red. I don't know, Jerry. You push the button, and it gives an electric shock to that person. It shocks their heart in hopes that the heartbeat might be restored. Now, I don't know what the, all the instructions are going to be. I bought these for, for Peterbilt 20 years ago, seriously. And I, knew, I was trained on them that long ago. I'm sure they've probably gotten better and easier to use. But I'm pretty sure, don't know the instructions, but I'm pretty sure the instructions don't say... Put the patches on. Wait to, for, to see if a heartbeat is detected. Okay, no heartbeat. Why don't you take a couple of days off? Take a vacation. Go four or five days. Go to Florida and come back. And then push the green button. What kind of outcome will we have if we're in this urgent situation where a life is, is not, is not going to last very long? The heart is stopped. You can't go very long without blood being pumped to the vital organs and that kind of thing. And so... It's not going to say, hey, take a few days off, come back in a week, and push the button. No. Because we don't have the power to do that. We can do some things, but listen, human beings are limited in their power. And I want to tell you that that kind of restoration is amazing, and it's an incredible thing, and I'm glad we have those advances in medicine where we can just have a machine that we bought for relatively low price, and you can push the green button and have somebody's heartbeat going again. That's wonderful. But we're limited as human beings. We serve a God that is unlimited. Amen? Amen. We serve a God Amen. whose right. restoration is not yeah. the kind of restoration I just described to you. Right. The restoration that he deals with is a miraculous restoration. The restoration that says, the machine told me to come back in four days and push the green button, and I did, and the heart started. That should not happen. <laughs> That will not happen with us. But with God, things like that happen. Amen? Yeah, yeah. And so God has this miraculous restoration, this ability to restore life. 
We serve that God, and he can do the things that should not happen. He's, a, he's able to do those things. And so you look at Luke chapter 8, the story of Jairus and Jairus' daughter. Jairus was a ruler of the synagogue, and, and here's, here's Jairus going to Jesus. His, his daughter is sick, and in fact, she's dying, and he runs to Jesus. Jesus, you've got to come and help me. You've got to come, and you've got to heal my daughter. And Jesus said, let's go. And that, on the way, they don't even get to the house. And one of the servants of Jairus comes and says, I'm sorry to tell you that your daughter has passed away. And if I was one of the disciples, Brother Chris, I'd be saying, you know what? I guess it's too late now. Yeah. It's too late. They were in a similar situation. Uh, Jesus and the disciples are going, I guess, to Bethany. And they're going to see Lazarus. Lazarus is sick. And in fact, he's dying. And in fact, Jesus told them at one point, guys, just so you understand, Lazarus is dead. Yeah. And the disciples are thinking, man. Because we think when death comes, it's too late. Yeah. There was another time when the disciples, the ones that were left, the ones that were still faithful to Christ, were huddled around a cross. And there was their Savior on the cross. And they still had some hope. Yet when he said it is finished and he gave up the ghost and died, they said, well, it's too late now. The kind of God that we serve, yeah. it's never too late with him. Yeah. Yeah. Even when there's no hope. Yeah. I want to tell you this morning that God is our source of hope. Yeah. God can, can take an impossible situation where there's absolutely no way it's going to work out. There's absolutely no chance That's right. when it's absolutely too late and there's not even a sliver of hope. Yeah. And he can bring this miraculous restoration to your life. Yeah. That's the kind of God we serve. Is that reason to believe? Amen. Mm -hmm. What about the next part of that verse? I love this part. It says, in the last part of that little section, it says that, he, that God, the God that we serve is the God who calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Now, in the human realm, when you think of it from human terms, if somebody, Brother Tom, is pretending that something exists when it doesn't, you kind of scratch your head and, and look for help, right? If it's a child, now we call it imagination. And pretending. You may have a, a young child that pretends they have an imaginary friend or they have an imaginary pet. Or maybe their, their doll or their teddy bear can really talk to them. That's called pretending, and that's okay. But when you become an adult and you still have an imaginary friend and you still have a doll and a teddy bear in the first place and you think they talk to you, you need some help because that's not normal. And we're not called to live in a world that's imaginary. And so when we say that something exists and it does not, in our own power, in our own mind, it's just imagination, and that's it. But yeah, you guess that God is different. With God, this kind of thinking is not called imagination. It's called creation. You remember Genesis 1.1? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered above the waters. And then it started. And God said. Mm -hmm. And then after that we have six days worth of creation where God created everything that currently exists. God created everything in six days. Now, if you don't believe that God can create something out of nothing, I don't, I'm not sure you know God. If you don't believe that God can take nothing and make something out of it, you haven't read Genesis chapter 1. You don't believe in the same God that I do. You have to have faith that God can take nothing and make something out of it. If you don't believe that, you're going to have trouble with the rest of this message. In fact, I'm going to make it harder on you a little bit. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says this about heaven. It says, eye has not seen, nor has ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has created, the things that he has in store for us, for those that love him, Right? So it's interesting when you think about how God can take something that doesn't exist and, call, and bring it into existence. But listen, it's, it's bigger than that. Not only can God bring into existence something that does not currently exist, he can bring something into existence that we do not even have the ability to imagine. Think about that for a second. We can't even imagine the things that God can do as his routine. Because this is one of his characteristics, the ability to create. 
I believe we've got every reason to believe God and to, to trust him as our only source of hope. Amen? Amen? So the story goes on and it talks about Abraham. And, and Abraham is an incredible, unbelievable, amazing example of faith. And his faith was amazing and incredible and unbelievable because it was a God-inspired faith. He didn't have this faith on his own. It was a God-inspired faith. You see the story of Abraham right here briefly in 18 through 21. You see, God called Abraham the father of many nations. He said, you're going to be the father of many nations, Abraham. God promised Abraham and his wife Sarah, you're going to have a child, and you're going to, your lineage is going to be so great, they're so numerous, that you can't even count them. They're going to be like the stars in the sky or the sand in, in the ocean on the beaches, and you're not going to be able to count them. There are going to be so many. Only problem was Abraham was 100 years old, just about. And the other problem was that Sarah was beyond childbearing years. So this was not something, Brother Russ, that you could just have regular, run-of-the-mill, off-the-shelf faith to believe in. It was going to take some great effort, some great faith to believe that God was going to answer this prayer or, respond, or fulfill this promise, right? So we look in verse 18. And we see this amazing example of faith. Listen to this. In verse 18, it says, Contrary to hope, in hope he believed. Contrary to the situations around him, contrary to the logic in his mind and even his emotions, he's thinking, there's no way that this is going to happen. There's absolutely no hope, but I'm still going to believe. That's a God-inspired hope. There's no reason to hope for something like that other than God. And so verse 20 says that Abraham, not only did he have this amazing faith, but it was incredible because he did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief. He didn't allow unbelief to enter into his mind or enter into his life and destroy the promise of God. And listen, the promises of God are set. They're done. There's, when God speaks it, it's going to happen. Yeah. And the only reason we doubt is we allow unbelief to come to our life because we can't see it. Abraham is a living example of an amazing faith that was inspired by God. Look at verse 21. I love this one. This one could be a great question to ask ourselves every day. Verse 21 says, being fully convinced. Are you fully condensed this morning? Or condensed? Are you fully convinced this morning? Do you really believe God? Yes. Do you believe him fully? Yes. Do you believe him completely? That's what he's saying. Being fully convinced that what God had promised, he was able to do. Yes, right. I think it even goes further than this, and I'm not trying to add to Scripture, but we see the example of Abraham's life and what he did and what God did after this. Not only did Abraham believe God could do it, Abraham believed because God promised it, he would do it. Right. And listen, if you believe the promises of God this morning and you only believe what he can do, you're only halfway there. True. You need to believe that he will do it. If you don't have both of those things, you don't have that fully convinced, amazing faith that Abraham had. Abraham was fully convinced. And now through the example of Abraham, we see what real faith looks like. If you look at the rest of the story of Abraham's life, you see that God is worthy of our faith and our trust. And this God-inspired faith can really accomplish things in our life. As you look at the life of Abraham and how all that turned out in God, he fulfilled every promise. Amen? That's the God that we serve. This is the kind of faith that he inspires. I want to try to give you a reason to believe. I want to give you an example of amazing faith that you can have if you'll allow God to build that faith inside of you. Yes. By grace are we saved through faith, and that not of itself is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Did you hear the part about faith? Mm. By grace, through faith, we believe that not of ourselves. It's not a faith that we dream up in our mind. It's a faith that God gives us to believe. It's a God-inspired faith. So I'm going to pause here for just a second. And I'm going to read something to you. I'm going to take a breath. <laughs> so... We're talking about physical things that God promised Abraham. We're talking about the fulfillment of those promises, right? I want you to understand that these physical things that God promised Abraham, 
They're only a picture of what was to come, right? Through the lineage of Abraham, Jesus was born as a baby to a virgin named Mary who was engaged to a man named Joseph and who both of them got visited by angels and the angels told them, look, the promise of God is about to be unfolded in front of your eyes and in fact, you're going to be part of it. And the angel came and told them this and these physical things that took place, they are representing the, the spiritual things that are going to take place and that God is going to do. And because of the faithfulness of God and the fact that he keeps his promises in the physical, we can trust him to take care of all the things in the spiritual. And the other part of this that I want you to remember is the angels visited Mary and Joseph. I've never been visited by an angel except the one time that I can remember. And despite the fact that those angels didn't come to me and say, Hey, Mark, the plan of God's going to be revealed, and you're a part of it. I'm going to show you something. <laughs> I'm going to show you something that will prove to you that you're going to be part of God's plan. If we look at the life of Jesus, we know that he came to earth for a purpose. We know that he came to earth to accomplish great things. We look at the life of Jesus and we see the reality of God's plan. Look at verse 25. I love these two statements. It's a really, gives you a really quick understanding of what Jesus did. Let me just read the verse. Why don't I read 24 and 25? 24 is good too. It says, but also for us, it shall be imputed to us, and it's talking about the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him, who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. I want to talk about those two things that Jesus did in the physical that accomplished great things in the spiritual realm. Listen to what it says. It says he was delivered up. He was delivered into the hands of sinful men, the Bible says. He was nailed to a cross. He gave up his life. They didn't take it from him. He gave up his wife, life willingly to pay the price for our sin. <clears throat> and because he paid the price for our sin, the second part is going to work for us. Let's, let's talk about that first. He was delivered up. The Bible says he was on the cross, like I said before, and he... he said it's finished and he gave up his ghost and he died and his disciples were there. The Bible says in Matthew 27 that the veil was torn from top to bottom and it took away that separation from God that we have because of sin. It says that there was a great earthquake. There's never been a more earth shattering, earthquaking sort of event than the death of Christ on the cross. That's going to have the biggest effect uh, ever on the earth. This, this affects eternity. It's a physical thing that took place that's going to affect the lives of people for eternity. It says that the graves were opened. That's an amazing thing to think about. You know, the wages of sin is death. The grave is, is the curse of sin. The curse is removed when Christ gave his life on the cross. And so here we have Jesus dying on the cross, being delivered up, giving his life. And then it says he was raised up. So that we could be justified. Yeah. He was raised up. So that we could be justified. It says in the last part of that verse. Uh, in Matthew 27. The last part of those verses I was reading. It says. Many of the bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection. They went to the holy city. And appeared to many. This was a foreshadowing of what was going to happen. Yeah. Jesus it says is the first fruits from the grave. These people after Christ's resurrection were raised out of their grave as a physical symbol of what's going to happen to us one day. Because of the resurrection, Jesus is able, because of his ascension even, he's able to sit at the right hand of the Father interceding for us. He sits at the right hand of the Father as a reminder to the Father that we are now considered righteous. Yes. He was raised for our justification. It's just as if we'd never sinned. Because of Jesus, God's plan has been taken from an idea, from imagination. God has brought it into reality through Christ. 
for those who believe. I want to give you a reason to believe this morning. I'm telling you, we've got plenty of reason to believe. We've got an example of what can, God can do in somebody's life if they'll have faith and they'll ask God for a God-inspired faith. We see through Jesus that God has kept his promises. The character of God becomes our source of hope. Nobody can take that hope away. The example of Abraham, the inspired faith. But look at the example of Jesus. The life and death and burial and resurrection of Christ. That's proof that God's plan is real. And you know, we can experience the reality of God's plan. We can become part of the plan for eternity if we'll believe. God's given us every reason. He's given us a great example. He's shown us that he keeps his promises. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you, do you, do you believe this morning? Yes, amen. Are you fully convinced? Yes. Do you really trust God this morning? There's lots of things going on in this world. And, you know, I'm getting tired of all the commotion about the virus. And I'm getting tired of all the commotion with the economy. And all of those things, I just get tired of all the ruckus that's going on. One day, God is going to bring an end to all that. <clears throat> And we're going to spend eternity somewhere. I think I said this last week. I'm going to say it again. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. It's going to be in heaven with God or eternally separated from Him in hell. That's the only two choices. And all we have to do, the Bible says, is believe and keep our hope and keep our faith in, in God. Keep our hope of salvation in Christ alone as Abraham did in God the Father to keep that promise. He said, and he's promised to keep us. To complete the work that he started in us. This morning, I hope you're fully convinced. I hope you really believe. I hope you understand that God can take your life. And make something amazing out of it. You may not have any faith in God right now because of all the things you've seen happening. But listen, God hasn't changed. His plan hasn't changed. And you can have your hope only in God. If you'll trust him, if you believe in him, I want you to stay. You may be here this morning and you've got a need in your life. There's a situation going on that you can't control. Maybe it's been going on for a long time. You know what God says? He says, lay that burden on me. Come to me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. Place your burden on me. I'll find your rest. I'll give you rest for your soul. I think that's what we need from God in the midst of all this turmoil. God has promised through Christ. He's shown us that he's faithful to keep his promise. He sent his only son to die for us. Why would he withhold any other blessing from you? You've got a need. I'm going to pray right now. We're going to have a time of invitation. If you need to come and pray, you come on. We'll pray with you. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We just praise you, Lord, that your word is true, that we can have hope in you, that we see the example of Abraham, and we know that you can give us the kind of faith that will get us through. We know, Lord, that because Jesus came, and it's a reality that he really did come to this earth, and he really died on the cross. We know that he paid the penalty for our sin. God, we know that he's a Savior that you sent so that we might live with you for eternity. God, we trust you. We believe you this morning. God, help our unbelief. God, bring us to that place where we're closer to you. Father, if there's somebody listening that has never given their life to Christ and they're feeling an emptiness and a lack of direction and a lack of purpose, Lord, these scriptures give us a reason to believe. They give them a, a reason to believe. God, I pray that you'd help us to fully believe, to be fully convinced. And Lord, help us to live our lives in that way. God, I pray that you bless this time of invitation, Lord. You have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. If you need to come and pray, you come on.
Give the Lord a hand, clap of praise. Father, we thank you.